So our next session is going to be an opportunity to look at a person who is uh, a founder, but he's also an investor and also a policy influencer. So this person is actually wearing multiple hats, <coughs> has played multiple roles, and had, uh, is an important uh, player in the Indian startup ecosystem, Kunal Bell, who is joining us uh, from Delhi. Kunal, I see you're there. Thank you. I know it's late in the evening for you. We appreciate your time. Uh, you can see Kunal's bio in, uh, if you use the QR code, I'm not going to go through his very extensive uh, and very impressive background in all the awards he's won. But, but as I said, he's played three roles, and all, all the three roles that we're going to talk about in this uh, entire summit. He's been an uh, entrepreneur, founder, he's been an investor, he's also been an important policy influencer, and I hope in this uh, session we can tap into all of those roles that he has, uh, he has played. So uh, Kunal, just to get us uh, started, you know, I want to start with the entrepreneur uh, part of it, the story first, and maybe take chronologically the other two roles that you're, you're playing. As an entrepreneur, you know, you came from uh, quite humble uh, origins. And I'm curious whether your humble origin is a reason for your success, or was it in spite of it that you've had the success? Well, firstly, thanks for having me, um, Professor Ramamurthy. It's great to be here. A real pleasure to be, while I can't see the audience, um, I'm sure it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a set of really smart and um, you know, folks excited about India and its immense potential. So great to be speaking to all of you. You know, I, I think that the upbringing plays such a big role eventually in what you end up doing in life. And at least I felt that uh, with my parents, even though they didn't have a lot to offer in terms of resources, etc. But there's one thing that there was a big focus on growing up is education, which is true for most, most Indians, uh, middle class Indians, particularly um, education was of paramount importance. And the only way, at least my parents ever thought that we would go into, we were going to change orbits as a family is if their children studied. Both my parents uh, didn't go to college. So um, uh, for them, the only key to uh, success, if you may, for the subsequent generations in the family was if we studied hard. And, and they obviously gave it everything. And I think when you grow up in a household where you see immense sacrifice, immense hard work, absolute relentlessness every single day, uh, it's hard to not imbibe that or have that imbibed and start running through your bloodstream as well. So I don't think I've really given this question a lot of thought, but I think as I think through it, um, it's mostly been putting one foot ahead of the other and not trying to think too far ahead in the future and not trying to think too far back in the past and focus as much as possible on what needs to be done here and now. So what brought you to the U.S. for your uh, studies? Yes, yeah, um, you know, my life is a string of um, highly serendipitous moments. And one such serendipitous moment was me studying for IIT and um, not getting in uh, to IIT. My elder brother had gotten into IIT, so there was a lot of expectation and pressure that I would also get in. However, I did not. and. You know, I could have uh, gone again and taken another stab at it or or um, just followed destiny, which was um, going to UPenn, uh, getting admission there. Actually, no one in my extended family had ever visited the U.S., uh, let alone studied there. So it was really quite a quite a change for me and, and my family. So I kind of just showed up with two bags, uh, two suitcases in August of 2002. Uh, and the, I remember vividly that the, the first day I was on campus at Penn uh, was the first day I'd ever interacted with a non-Indian person in my life. <laughs> it was quite a unique experience in itself. But, uh, but, you know, somewhere deep down within, I felt that I wanted to always, I wanted to start something of my own. I tried when I, even when I was in school, I would try like small projects, try to make small amount of money. And... Um, and this particular program at Penn, which is the Jerome Fisher program, the management technology program, I had heard from someone I knew that this program is meant for people who want to uh, 
uh, indulge or uh, engage in the world of technology entrepreneurship. So I literally just had applied to one college. Um, it was just very naive of me. And I got in and just, you know, like I said earlier, just put one foot ahead of the other one and not really thinking too far ahead. Now, when you finished, you went to work for uh, Microsoft. Uh, and then I understand you, your uh, H-1B visa was turned down and you had to go back to India. Talk about that. Yeah, as I said, um, my life's really been uh, just a string of highly unplanned serendipitous uh, moments and detours and forks in life. Um, and, you know, it's a coin toss whether you get your visa or not. And I thought that Microsoft is a very, you know, sort of wealthy and large and influential organization. And they would figure out a way to um, get my visa through. And I literally just sitting on my desk in Seattle one day, I got an email, one line email which said that, um, sorry, your H-1B application or they call it petition has been rejected. Uh, so please talk to your manager about next steps. And next steps are basically bye-bye. <laughs> and, you know, while they were obviously very nice about it, uh, and they said, we can get you a role at Microsoft India, or and then you can try again one year later, I felt that some of these things are clear signs. Uh, I felt if I, if I was going to come back to my country, I might as well work for myself and build something here as compared to work for someone else. So your plan B was uh, starting Snapdeal, which sounds better than plan A. Yeah, I think, uh, well, it was not even plan, this was not even plan B. I think it's just, um, you know, when I started it, we oftentimes talk about pivots, right? Like the number of pivots we've had to do in our entrepreneurial journey is, um, you know, I've sort of lost count. I think I've run out of fingers <laughs> to count the number of pivots we've had to do. And when we started, we started as a, like a coupon book business, like entertainment publications in the US, like this selling discount, a magazine with terrible discount coupons. Snapdeal came about two, three years after that. Uh, but I think we were just, uh, when I say we, my, my co-founder and close friend from high school, Rohit and I, we started everything together. We've been investing together now for um, uh, many years, more than a decade. But our, uh, we've just been very relentless. We've never thought that um, you know failure was an option. So if the coupon book didn't work, we said, okay, there's some problem with it. People don't want to carry a magazine with them. Let's turn it into a card. The card didn't work. Let's turn it into an SMS. SMS didn't work. Let's turn it into an online platform. Okay, now the coupons are no longer... Uh, as much uh, or that market is not very large let's start selling other things on the same platform which is physical products so we just we kept on iterating and uh, whenever we would get we would get non-conforming evidence about the business either in terms of its potential or its product market fit it didn't really bother us i mean it bothers us, bother, bothered us for a little bit and then we were quickly on the job of figuring out okay hence what do we need to do to keep moving forward and not not stall do you ever wonder what you might have done if you stayed in the U.S.? I would have definitely started a company. I think that was my plan. Um, I would probably have worked for two, three years, and then I would have started something once my visa situation would have been sorted. Uh, that was uh, absolutely clear in my head. So I, I do feel, though, that um, I have to be thankful uh, to the USCIS system that they uh, you know, allowed me to save about three years of my life. <laughs> now, you sound remarkably composed as you look back at that time, but I would think it had to have been devastating. Or is that, some, is that a quality you have that allows you to be very placid or uh, calm in the midst of this kind of uh, turmoil? Yeah, I think it's a manufacturing defect. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. I think you know, someone I think once said that your greatest powers come from your greatest wounds. I can tell you I have many, 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 many. So uh, our, the journey of entrepreneurship has been uh, long and arduous and demanding and challenging, also very rewarding and, and a blessing. So when you see both sides, uh, the good and the bad and the alcohol, well, I guess there's a third side of ugly also at times. When you've seen all the, all the corners of this journey, uh, if you haven't dealt how to, if you haven't figured out how to deal with the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows, um, it's going to be hard to last very long because it, 
we'll see both. Now, at some point along the way, you created Titan Capital as a vehicle for investing in early stage companies. How did that come about? Look, we just wanted to help founders. Uh, I don't think we wanted to set up an investment business, to be honest, which um, it has become uh, over a period of time. Uh, you know, when we were starting, uh, I remember there was nothing known as a startup in India. There was either you did a job or you ran a business. There's nothing, no, there's no terminology uh, called startup. And I, I recall vividly we had gone to some someone who uh, was introduced to us by a common connect saying that this person just returned from the US, his father is a wealthy real estate uh, developer in, um, in, in New Delhi, and he wants to back young people like you. Because we, we had no money, right? Like uh, me and my co-founder Rohit, we had grant, I think we started with a grand total of about what would be in today's terms, about $35,000, which was the total savings he and I had of myself working for one year at Microsoft and him working for one year at Capital One. So cumulatively about $35,000. $35, That's all we had and we were gonna run out of it pretty quickly. And someone introduced us to this person. We were, for two hours, we were explaining it and the person was nodding and like, really he was into it. And we felt that both Rohit and I would look at each other, exchange smiles in, my, in our eyes and we would know that, okay, this definitely, this is gonna convert. And uh, at the end of the meeting, the person said, okay, give me a few minutes, I'll come back to you, I think this is very interesting. And then he came back into the room and he said, um, I'd like to invest uh, you know, the equivalent of probably $75,000 now uh, for 60% of the company. So that was what was the concept of uh, angel investing uh, in, in India at that point in time. And I think somewhere in that moment, um, without, without saying it to each other, or articulating it in as many words, we did feel that if we ever got the opportunity to back the next generation of founders, but in a more fair way and in a way that we can also mentor them beyond just capital, we must, we absolutely must do that. So that's really how it started. And it started with, I think our first investment, um, I was at a travel conference pitching them to sell online coupons or travel coupons on our Snapdeal platform. And walking out of the conference, I ran into uh, this sharp young uh, fellow. He was like, Kunal, I just want to talk to you. I've just started a new business in the transportation space. I was like, okay, sure, let's chat. I was waiting for my car. And we chatted for 10 minutes. And he said, yeah, I'm doing this transportation thing where you can big book a cab from a website, uh, not an app, not a mobile site. Um, and um, I'm calling it Ola. And, and I said, uh, sounds very interesting. So I made him talk to Rohit also over a call. And then we just decided to invest. And that company obviously became the largest uh, mobility company, uh, you know, app mobility company uh, like Uber in the country. And that's how we started. And I think as, as we all started seeing a little more success in our own entrepreneurial life uh, lives, as well as, um, you know, Founders were saying good things about our ability to help them through really, really when they were really in a pickle. Um, so one thing led to the other. Now, present day, we've now invested over the last 12 years in about 270 companies. Uh, many have done uh, well uh, and because of the founders. I, I would hate it if our investors took all the credit um, and hence we take no credit. I think it's the founders at work and we just were there in the early days to avoid some missteps and give them the initial capital. Hmm. So t talk a bit about why the India startup uh, landscape is so exciting these days. Yeah, I think it's the place to be. Uh, clearly, you have a conference dedicated to it. Uh, the startup nation, it really is. Uh, look, India is a country which always has had a lot of promise, uh, a lot of potential. Everyone's always saying that India has a lot of potential. It does seem something has changed now where, and there are some structural changes. I was hearing to the end part of Mr. Bakshi's, Dr. Bakshi's uh, talk about all the stuff that's going happening on the DPI side, which is digital public infrastructure in India. It is really transformational. Uh, the fact that 
you know, you don't carry very quickly in a period of five years, you've gone from everyone carrying cash to people carrying nothing but their phone. And that is very, very prevalent in our country right now. It's absolutely pervasive. The fact that I think we don't realize sometimes um, it's important to zoom out from 81 to 80, 1700. India was a top two GDP in the world. It's after 350 years, we are going to be a top three GDP in the next seven years. So clearly something is very different this time. And um, the, the fact that, you know, we are a very young country right now and will be for some time. The fact that we are, we have a billion people online. The fact that, you know, we have all this digital public infrastructure uh, around direct remittance of funds to the, those who need it of subsidies, of uh, just the amount of productivity and efficiency that has crept in in the country because of all the connectivity through smartphones and, and UPI and other infrastru digital infrastructure that has been built. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't realize that uh, over the last, um, I think India's economy was, we've added about, we're at, we've added almost like, uh, we've added trillions of dollars in just the last 20, 20 years uh, in, into our economy. But we are going to add about three and a half trillion in just the next seven years. So the, um, uh, the, the government here is very focused on what they call seven and seven, which is uh, in, in seven years, we want to be a seven trillion economy. Now, assuming that we have ballpark the similar population that we have as of today, which is give or take, give or take 1.4, 1.5 billion, and double the economy, we are at 3.5 trillion right now, the per capita GDP will almost double. And what that means is that we are going to cross uh, this threshold of about three and a half, four thousand dollars $4,000. We are at about $2,300, $2,400 per capita GDP. So we're going to easily cross three and a half, four thousand in the next seven years. If you look at China, you look at Indonesia, you look at most of the countries that have really broken through the growth barrier and broken past this, you know, barrier of having a lot of poverty, etc. Uh, it seemingly happened around the four thousand dollar per capita GDP. And in the next seven years, we're going to cross that for the first time, at least since the time we have been recording probably this metric. So there is something which is different this time, uh, and it is palpable if you're on the ground here, you can feel the buzz, you can feel the excitement. We're clearly, you know, we're launching satellites in space uh, for other countries and other startups in other parts of the world. When did that happen last year? Hmm. So um, it is obviously an incredible, incredible time to be in India, and, and it's no surprise that so many people are coming back as a result. Yeah. In terms of your own philosophy with Titan Capital as you make investments, you, you already gave us a hint of uh, what you look at and what your motivation is. But what do you look for in the investment? You don't obviously invest in everyone who comes up and talks to you. Yeah, yeah we are very, very selective. I think our, our team looks at about 2,000 proposals a year. Of that, we end up investing in maybe 10. Um, so we are known to be incredibly selective. And, uh, and you need to be, if you want to, you know, we, we don't have any external investors in Titan. Uh, it's only our capital. So the only way we can keep this going is um, by investing in good companies that have good exits, which we plow back, um, you know, 100% of all exits, we plowed back into the next cohort of uh, founders in the last 12 years. I would largely say we look at three things, which is uh, obviously the quality of the team, for us, that is very, very important. And how we quantify it or how we try and make sense of it is by saying that, have they demonstrated success in anything before? It could be academic success, it could be success in sports, arts, dance, um, you know, doing a not-for-profit, like anything, absolutely anything. Um, it doesn't have to be only related to academic pedigree because the startup is about dealing with, you know, it's this John Keats said uh, about having negative capability, which is uh, dealing, having the capability to thrive even in a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And uh, generally to be successful at almost anything, even if you have natural talent for it, you probably have to go through 
a circuitous path of uncertainty. Uh, and if you've dealt through it and gotten to success at the end of it, means you have that negative capability. Um, and and that we found to be, we have found to be absolutely paramount uh, input for a startup success. The second would be, uh, you know, just uh, the uh, you know the size of the market. We are actually not looking for, we are looking for overall markets that may be large, but at the same time, which may sound contrarian to the comment I just made, at this point in time, at the early stages, because we're very disciplined about doing all these seed investing, we only we we like companies to be incredibly focused on discipline, uh, incredibly incredibly focused on discipline on a very narrow sliver in the market. What we internally call laughably small tabs, uh, which sounds very contrarian, where everyone is after the largest tab. You have to show like a ten billion, hundred billion dollar tab. We really don't care for that because a startup with uh, five hundred thousand dollars is not going to be able to make much of a dent on a hundred billion tab just yet. So in the early stages, you just have to focus on an incredibly, like an incredibly small, incredibly laughable, uh, laughably, laughably small tab. Uh, and the third would be the ability to generate unit economics. At least uh, this is the, after the after the frothiness of 21, um, where funding was coming in thick and fast. I think now everyone has sort of converged to this philosophy. But we've been fairly disciplined on this for many years now, where uh, it's very hard to turn. A lot of times I would meet founders who would say that, yeah, my, my margins today are 10%, but with scale, they'll become 50%. Across the thousand plus companies or thousands of companies I would have met, I have never seen that happen. Never, ever. Um, I tell founders, yes, a, your 10% margin business can become a 50% margin business, but I can assure you, you will be in a different business then. It won't be this business. So you have to decide very early on, are you a squirrel with a tail or an elephant with a trunk? You can't be like tail and trunk both at the same time. So uh, these are the three things that we tend to focus on, but I would say it's highly overweight on the on the team on the team quality. What, what other uh, advice, advice would you give to some of the young people in our audience who might be entrepreneurs in the future beyond the three pointers? You know, just um, selecting the right partner um, to to build it with. It's, there are very few examples of single founder companies working out, at least I don't know of any, uh, but I'm sure there are some. Uh, just because I don't know doesn't mean they don't exist, um, but I have not seen any. I think finding a great partner is so critical and so crucial. Um, I was blessed that I, had a, I have a business partner who I've known for now you know, 25 years since high school. There is tremendous amount of mutual trust and respect and um, and a complementary set of skill sets and mindset and and finding finding someone like that and investing the energy in, in finding the right person is actually quite paramount the other thing I would say is that uh, entrepreneurship or building a company is a 10 15 20 year journey uh, oftentimes I would tell founders that spend at least five percent of the time, on the pick, spend at least 5% of the time figuring out what you're going to build, what you're going to dedicate the next 10, 20 years of your life on. Don't rush into the first idea that you saw got funded in you know, some other market and say, this sounds like an exciting idea. Let me, uh, let me pursue this. Um, so we, we tend to push founders a lot on ha are they, have they really diligenced this idea to the absolute edge of the cliff? And are they still convinced about pursuing this idea or not? And so that's um, that would be the other thing. And then finally, I think picking the right investment partners. Uh, this sounds like generic advice, but I can tell you that it makes a world of difference, especially in the early days. I feel in later stages, quality of investor matters, but it matters a tremendously, a tremendous amount more in the early days of the company because a good investor will help you um, you know, set the right guardrails early on and make sure that you're not making the same mistakes that many, many, many founders before you uh, have made and just reduces the amount of wastage of time and resources, dilution of your equity and ensures that you can uh, make a lot of progress and iterate faster 
uh, without consuming all the resources, all the limited resources that you have. Terrific. I think that's a lot of wonderful uh, advice. I'm going to ask for a question. So if people have any questions, please raise your hands. Uh, one over here, please, and then one over there. Uh, <clears throat> if you could just very quickly say who you are and get to the question straight away. And the camera, can you please get, uh, get the student? Hello. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Um, I'm Dia. I just had a quick question on Snapdeal specifically. Since Snapdeal is in the uh, e-commerce uh, section, are you looking at Q-commerce uh, as something you want to venture into for convenience or a quicker turnaround for the upcoming tick in uh, a need for con convenience from the customer side? Yeah, thank you, Diyad, and that's a good question. Um, you know, every e-commerce company has to focus on what does it want to be known for, what does it want to be famous for, what does it want to specialize in, and not just e-commerce, any company. But particularly in e-commerce, um, one thing is very clear in Indian e-commerce that if you want to cater to everyone, uh, cater everything to everyone, it is going to be tremendously hard to make money. And we continue to see that in the financials of companies, the global companies that are playing that strategy in India, where they continue to lose uh, quite a, a tremendous amount of capital, uh, even now many years into making billions of investments. So structurally, it seems that that is a very, very, very long game and probably can only be played by, you know, multi-trillion dollar companies or trillion dollar companies. Unfortunately, we realize we are not that. Uh, we are not a trillion dollar company or anything close to it. So within the resources that are available to us, we have to find the part of the market where we feel uh, we can satisfy the needs of the customer and delight the customer, but also generate the unit economics that our business needs to generate to be sustainable and, and grow sustainably. Uh, quick commerce is a very interesting segment, uh, but it doesn't necessarily overlap much with the categories that Snapdeal focuses on, which is mostly lifestyle like fashion and apparel, uh, accessories, uh, home, beauty, etc. Those are categories that are usually not time sens not time sensitive purchases. Uh, time Q commerce we've seen is generally a little more um, centered around food and uh, food like household daily household needs as compared to things which are more discretionary. Hence, it's probably not a good fit for our business. Um, but, but you know, I see it in India these days, at least in the metros, everyone's using the quick commerce. Uh, we, have, we have multiple quick commerce companies in India. I think uh, um, they're serving the customers really, really well. And the customers seem to be extremely happy. I think what, what one has to see in the, in the medium to long run is uh, would that translate into um, good unit economics for these businesses or not. Uh, Kunal, that uh, comment <clears throat> uh, makes me uh, want to get into the IPO as an exit option for Indian startups. And I think the record that has not been very uh, encouraging. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, uh, look, I think uh, we. what has happened is that we've, we've gone head first um, into as as an ecosystem into the public markets by taking some of the highest valued companies public first at obviously when they went public at high values um, and if you look back if you roll back time when you look at the IPOs of tech companies in the US in the 80s and 90s these are all like 300 million dollar IPOs or 300 million dollar market cap companies when they went public where 75% was owned by the founder, 25% was maybe owned by two VCs, um, and they raised a grand total of 20 million maybe. And so everyone made out really good, and these $300 million companies became the um, two, three, five, ten $10 billion companies eventually. In India, we've just tried to, we like to skip things. We skip the <clears throat> fixed line phones, and uh, I think we as an ecosystem probably felt we can, fit, we can skip uh, doing IPOs of companies that probably can be, um, you know, more easy to digest for the for the public markets in India. I do feel that while some of the public companies that did list two years ago have come back, and I think their stock prices are doing well now, whether that's driven by India's macros or 
just or their performance or a bit of both. Um, the the fact of the matter is that they are better, doing better than they were, let's say, a year and year ago. Uh, all that said, I feel that the way to build strong foundations for um, you know IPO being a viable, repeatable, and successful uh, exit path for Indian startups is to have a flurry of and uh, an ongoing flurry of smaller cap, smaller revenue, profitable, highly predictably growing, um, more software brands, those type of companies rather than B2C companies, which are likely subject to a lot more competitive pressures, uh, B2C consumer internet companies, which are usually subject to a lot more pressure by international players, domestic players, etc. I feel that the public markets in India keep seeing um, you know, 300, 400, 500 million dollar market cap companies come out uh, that continue to perform, grow at 30 to 50 percent a year, generate you know healthy, predictable profitability uh, in public markets. It will build tremendous credibility and it will establish new age companies or technology companies as a segment that everyone invests in. And and I feel that it has started happening. Some companies have gone public in that segment. I can already see a pipeline of companies in that segment getting ready to go public in the next year or two. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about the future, but I do feel the future looks like a lot of smaller cap, small to mid cap uh, technology companies listing as compared to $5 billion, $10 billion, $20 billion companies listing. Got it. Uh, so question from another student. Are you, are you able to see the student when he asks the question, Kunal? Mm -hmm. So, no? that's okay. Sorry, Adam. If there's a way that it, uh, our guests can also see the students, that'd be great. Anyway, go ahead with the question, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarthak. First of all, thank you, Ravi and Kunal, for such a great discussion. Um, so, my question is like, given that companies like Snapdeal, Amazon, Flipkart have already made a good contribution in the retail sector. Um, what do you what like what opportunities do you see for young contributor uh, young entrepreneurs to contribute in the retail sectors and what are your suggestions for us getting into the retail sector thank you see i feel that one of the biggest opportunities in india is that we are incredibly brand underpenetrated as a country um, most consumers continue to use less known, unorganized regional brands or brands which are more global company centric or global company brands, which have been around for like decades or maybe hundred years. At least I strongly feel that this new generation of millennials, Gen Z, etc. Uh, um, in their mind, there's a, there is a concept which is very deeply embedded whether they realize it or not, which is they don't want to own their parents' brand. They, not because of any disrespect, but just the way the world works. They don't want to be sitting on the same two-wheeler that their father sat on. They don't want to use the same toothpaste that their mother gave them to use when they were growing up. They, uh, they don't want to use the same phone uh, that they see their teachers and their, um, you know, older people in their workplace use. They're, those choices are becoming incredibly... Um, visible that you know which is why let's take uh, companies like um, you know Ola Electric why are people buying I don't think it's necessarily because of the carbon footprint only I'm sure that is one of the reasons uh, it's not necessarily because there's a big cost differential between a two-wheeler uh, electric versus uh, IC uh, climate consciousness is, uh, you know, important, but I don't think it's a, the biggest driver. Is that they want to they want to use a brand that uh, you know their parents didn't use. Uh, same thing. I call it the one plus effect. Why are they buying one plus phones? They are pretty decent phones, but so are Samsung phones and so are um, uh, you know other brands. But there's a reason they are buying one plus is because they just want to use something that their parents don't use. And while this may seem frivolous but it is defining the consumption of an entire generation in our country right now. And that means also that it opens a tremendous opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs or prospective entrepreneurs such as yourself 
uh, to build new brands. You know, there is a company where I was a seed investor, or I am a seed investor, still an investor, which is in the news last few days uh, because they are going public um, in the next uh, week and a half or so called Mama Earth, which is in the baby product space. And I had invested in them six years ago when they just started. The company was doing about $10,000 of, of monthly sales when I invested. Now they do 25 million, I think, or whatever the number, whatever is a public number, I don't keep the non-public number, but it's somewhere in that, I think maybe 20 million or 25 million a month um, uh, type, type uh, scale. Uh, you know, why? You know, there are other well-known global brands like Johnson & Johnson, et cetera, but why, are, why did suddenly new mothers start using Mama Earth out of the blue? A brand that nobody knew for their children, not for themselves, but for their children. And I discovered that brand uh, in the shower of my uh, in my in my kids' uh, bathroom shower. That's how I discovered it, and that's how we made the investment. I just turned the bottle around, and there was a phone number of the founder who I called, and he came the next day, and we made the investment. And six years later, that company is going public. So. Um, I, I do feel that there will be hundreds of mamas in India of different size and scale uh, because uh, there is, it's a right market for the consumers to try out new things and they want to try out new things. <clears throat> Kunal, can you tell us what are the other brands that are in your bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you I think know, I, time. <clears throat> um, yeah. The many, there is, there is as I said, uh, even when we had spoken a week ago, I uh, I really do feel uh, I genuinely do. I'm, I uh, you know I'm I'm not a very religious person, but I genuinely I genuinely do feel with the number of serendipitous events that have happened in my life, uh, I feel God does have a plan. <laughs> I don't know what kind of plan it is, but there is definitely some plan. So I just keep going with the flow. Well, thank you. I hope that plan will include a visit to Boston sometime when we can pick your brains in more depth. This has been absolutely, sure. absolutely delightful. We could go on for much longer, but I know that our time is up and we've been keeping you pretty late uh, Indian time. So thank you, Kunal, and we look forward to hosting you here in, at Northeastern University within 12 months. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. It was a real pleasure. And I hope, uh, I feel if this conversation motivates any one of you to come back to India and start a company, my job is done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sure it will, I'm sure it will. <clears throat> thank you, Kunal.